Welcome to presentation number 21 in our series, Reading Revelation. We have reached chapter 17, a very intriguing chapter. And I have put as the title, The Beast That Was and Is Not and Is to Come. And <clears throat> oodles of effort uh, have been put into <clears throat> understanding these uh, uh, these terms, these expressions, and I have put in my effort too, <clears throat> to put it that way. So let's see what we find here. And we have our outline here, uh, and the title, The Beast That Was and Is Not and Is to Come. Revelation 17, all of the chapter. <clears throat> and here in the first the introduction here, 17, 1 to 6, stunned. In the wilderness, a woman colluding with the beast. And I have an exclamation, exclamation mark there. And then the remainder of the chapter is explanation. And the explanation is an expose of the mystery that we find here. So we have <coughs> Albrecht Dürer's representation here. Uh, of the woman sitting on the beast. And the character of that beast is a big issue here. What is it? What will we find? So <clears throat> here then, this is what we are doing. Stunned in the wilderness, and we are ready to read. <clears throat> and one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, remember we have just finished the seven bowls, but the person who participated in, in those bowls, or the angel that participated, is still in the story and remains in the story until chapter 22. So keep that in mind. One of the angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the verdict on the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have engaged in sexual Im immorality, and the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk with the wine of her immorality. Uh, that's how it starts. And here in the Angers Apocalypse, we have a woman seated on many waters. We will later be told that waters are people. So this is someone who in a ruling position, and may be also in a position where she enjoys popular support. Who knows? But this is <clears throat> in the Angers Apocalypse, and here is the Cambrai. Uh, an angel is going to, this is the angel taking him by the hand, and I will show you uh, this phenomenon, the woman who is seated on many waters. And there is a pretty... Uh, he says we will have a verdict, but here is also the indictment of immorality and and other things. <clears throat> so, uh, and we have this idea of, as prostitute. We will be told in a minute that this phenomenon is called Babylon. We have already been told of Babylon in chapter 14 and at the end of chapter 16. So <clears throat> these terms are already in play. But here Babylon is <clears throat> described as a prostitute. And the Bible has a lot to say. The concept of prostitution has a history in the Bi Bible, in the Old Testament. Uh, it is the question of faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. For prostitution to apply, there has to be prior faithfulness that in some ways is let go of. And you have then prostitution. I have four texts to show this. And invariably, when this term is used in the Old Testament, it applies to Israel. And Israel in the Old Testament is the counterpoint and contrast to Babylon. So here are some intriguing possibilities. <clears throat> here in Isaiah, how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She that was full of justice, 
righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. So here you have a descent from faithfulness to unfaithfulness, and it is called prostitution. <clears throat> the, here in Jeremiah, second of the large of the of the major prophets in the Old Testament, for long ago you broke your yoke and burst your bonds, and you said, I will not serve on every high hill and under every green tree. You sprawled and played the whore. Prostitution here, prostitution here. These are descriptions of Israel, unfaithfulness on the part of someone expected to be faithful. Here is Ezekiel, the third of the major prophets. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your fame and lavished your whorings on any passerby. It's very severe indictment here in Ezekiel chapter 16. And here one last one from Hosea. Do not rejoice, O Israel. Do not exult as other nations do. For you have played the whore departing from your God. You have loved the prostitute's pay on all threshing floors. So when we read of prostitution here, the connotation that comes to it from the Old Testament is the connotation of someone who was faithful and no longer is faithful. There has been a descent, a sort of a... a apostasy if you if you wish <clears throat> that's the uh, old testament <clears throat> background on that on that point so <clears throat> here i have in the middle i have in the middle the text we are reading in revelation same one we just read it come i will show you the verdict on the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have engaged in sexual immorality, and the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk with the wine of her immorality. The term prostitute is a term that applies to Israel and Jerusalem. How the faithful city has become a prostitute. She that was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. So this is the connection here, from faithful to unfaithful. That's what we are seeing and the notion of prostitution. But then we also read that uh, kings of the earth have become drunk with the wine of her immorality. And the notion of wine and getting drunk and so on, that is more associated with Babylon in the Old Testament. So here we have from Jeremiah, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine, and so the nations went mad. So here we have drinking wine, and here drinking wine associated with Babylon. And we have in some ways a coming together, a conflation of images from faithful Jerusalem here, becoming more like her polar opposite, Babylon here. Those are the terms uh, so far, and we have already, we have only read <coughs> two verses in Revelation 17. And let's read on. So, a revelation taking place in the wilderness. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of slanderous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And here I have Martin Leonard's modern illustration of the beast here, or, or we will see what kind of beast that is, red it is, and the woman sitting on the beast, and she is color-coded to match completely. They are having the same, same color. <clears throat> uh, and we are reading more about that, because <clears throat> the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. Those are images of royalty, and of worldliness. 
both. There is a kind of purple and scarlet is, it does have a prestigious connotation and a negative connotation. And adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her prostitution. So she is dishing out slander and doing <clears throat> some things that isn't, isn't good. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of the prostitutes and of the earth's ad ad abominations. And here, mother of the prostitutes is, <clears throat> could mean she is the first one. She is the sort of, uh, she is the first prostitute, but it could also be that she is the worst one, the sort of gold standard for how this notion of prostitution may play out. Uh, so <clears throat> both of those are possible. And I saw more bad things, and I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the believers and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And all of this is quite well captured in Martin Leonard's uh, illustration. Here we have peoples in the support in the background, and here we have the prostitute, color match to the beast, and here we have victims of violence here, that this has been a persecuting uh, power and one that has in some ways slandered and misrepresented God. <clears throat> and Let's see, this one uh, is an older uh, illustration, uh, Gehring uh, and Gerung in, uh, from 1531, I believe. And here we have the beast and we have the prostitute and we have the cup and we have the accompanying angel showing John this scene. <coughs> and we are in the wilderness. So <coughs> what to make of that? <coughs> We are here in the wilderness that we read in the beginning, and here is another encounter with wilderness in Revelation chapter 12. The woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly to her safe place in the wilderness from the face of the serpent. So we have some scenes, we have some connections here, maybe we can make something of them. Here is one possibility. Everything is important in the book of Revelation. Nothing is haphazard. And here is wilderness in Revelation 17 and wilderness in Revelation 12. It must be important. The location known for safety, refuge and protection is now the, a location or the location replete with horror and ill forebodings. Let's read that. So we see here in our text again, just reading half of a verse. And I was extremely horrified with a great horror when I saw her. So this body language here, the sort of reaction that John has to this scene is just yeah, what to say. I don't know what, what to make of this. How can it be? These are, uh, there is a kind of redundancy here. You can see that the verb and the nouns are the same. Ethaumasa and Thauma Mega. Those are horrified with a great horror. <clears throat> uh, you can't say more. And here is a face. <coughs> to go with it in a modern depiction, and I will give you a better one in a minute uh, that is uh, not quite as modern, but, but it is even better. Let's digress for a moment to savor the way the book of Revelation uses body language to impress a certain message on us, how John by body language plays out states of mind, moods, reactions for us. So we will go back to chapter one here. And John has just seen a vision of the risen Christ walking among the candlesticks in the book. 
And here is the body language. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, just overwhelmed by the sight. And when we see him doing that, we might just also try to see what he sees and maybe wish to experience what he experienced. That's the kind of, uh, uh, I think, the pedagogy of it. Here is the vision of the risen Christ and flaming fire and this two-edged sword. And here we have our, our, uh, the revelator or the one who is witnessing the revelation. That's what he does. Uh, uh, there, that's his body language. Uh, here is another one. This is in the heavenly council when the uh, scroll sealed with seven seals is presented and there is no one who can open it. And we read that I wept and wept profusely because no one was found to have what it takes to open the scroll or to look into it. And here it is a little harder to find a good pictorial representations. This is the Jews apocalypse. This is the scroll sealed with seven seals. And this is the body language of John, no, uh, being told that no one can, can um, open it. And he is weeping here. There are tears. It's not uh, easy to see it, but we see a person in a state of grief. I will try to <clears throat> make it even bigger. This is the context, the uh, scroll with seven seals. And here there is an interaction between John who watches it and someone here who is in the heavenly council. I'll magnify it even more. Here you see them, a close up of the two. He has been weeping. And here he is told, don't weep anymore. There is someone we have found who can do it. My point is body language. And here is my third one on body language. That's where we are in Revelation 17. I was extremely horrified with a great horror when I saw her. This isn't what he had expected, as it were. And I will go back to Gering, Gerung's uh, illustration here. And I will magnify him here. And I will say that I have a better illustration for John, what he is experiencing. It takes someone from Norway to do this right. This is Edward Munch's scream. And this, I propose, is the state of mind of John in the book of Revelation. This matches, this does a good job. I was extremely horrified with a great horror when I saw her. <clears throat> That's where we are. So I have delayed showing this <clears throat> slide again, the cross-linking, the centrality of chapter 12, influencing the early part of Revelation and influencing the downstream from chapter 12. And I have also shown a bridge here uh, and that one applies again. From here is the trumpet sequence. And here we are in chapter 17. That is the chapter of interest, this one here. And here the bridge running from the trumpets into chapter 17. And then <clears throat> we are going to make another arrow from chapter 12 into chapter 17. So there are all kinds of cross links here to help us, but it probably only helps the rereader, the assiduous rereader, because there are complex relationships here. <clears throat> so in chapter 12 then, in the first part of chapter 12, we have a dragon who is the fallen star in the Revelation, who pulls down a third of the stars of heaven, and he is taking up his position in front of the woman, the believing community who is pregnant and about to give birth. That's chapter uh, uh, 12. And he is defeated in his design on <clears throat> that woman. Then we have at the ending of Revelation uh, 12 in the third section there, 
we have the dragon pursuing the woman. She is still the believing community. She is not Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, but she is the believing community, the embodiment of that community. And the dragon is pursuing her and she makes a narrow escape. That's what we are seeing. But we do need to see a relationship between this woman here and that woman there. That is inev inevitable. Now I will shrink her down so she fits here. And we will go to Revelation 17. There is a woman, there is a desert, and there is an animal. So we are interested in finding if there could be a relationship here. So here is Albrecht Dürer's relation, uh, uh, picture. The woman is sitting on, uh, on a beast and I will magnify, uh, I will take away the, the others, the distractions here. I'll take away what is in between here and I will magnify Dürer's uh, woman and beast. And then we will ask the question, so is there still a relationship here that the dragon here who fails in his attempt on the woman here has in fact here in the desert somehow managed to subvert her, to make something that works for him, that the dragon here and the beast that comes out from the earth here are in some ways related. They might just be identical. That's the possibility. And just likewise that the woman here at one point had a ideological or moral or sense of being that virtuous woman here and she isn't anymore. Let's, let's uh, add it up. A place of protection has, by my logic, and these are just propositions, a place of protection has become a place of seduction. A woman fleeing the dragon, and now a woman cooperating with him. Is that what we're seeing? A woman speaking well of God here in this one, and now a woman dishing out slander, and here, a woman persecuted, and now a woman persecuting, and a faithful woman, a faithful woman here, and now a prostitute, and a mystery indeed. And if this is what is coming together to John, it is no wonder that he lets out a scream just like in Edward Munch's painting. That would not be strange. But these are just possibilities at this stage. We have to look and read more of the chapter to see where this leads. The mystery will be explained. And the angel said to me, why are you so horrified? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast carrying her, the one with seven heads and ten horns. And here then <clears throat> we have the angel saying that to John that he will explain what we are seeing here and we can't wait. <clears throat> and it is quite dense. This is the angel talking. And <clears throat> the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will be amazed in a positive sense when they see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. That's the text, the explanation, and this is what, what we will do with it. There is an ontological issue here. Ontology is the study of things that exist of beings. <clears throat> so here the beast is described ontologically, what the beast would like to be, but isn't. There is a story in time. These are temporal terms. It was, it is not, 
than it is to come. Past, present, and future, those are temporal terms. And there is a story in space, because we are told that it will come from the bottomless, uh, from the bottomless pit here. So we have ontology, story in time, story in space, and we have the end of the story, the course. It goes to destruction. All of those, one at a time, we will now look at them. First, the ontological issue, the ontological contrast. How is this beast related to other beings? How is it related to God? So God is described here in Revelation and always this way in the beginning of the book, grace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's God. And this is not, as we saw when we did this chapter, that this is not just God described as someone who is self-existent. This is also God who is the one who is with somebody. That's what we said at that time. But here we are doing more basic stuff. I am here in chapter, still in chapter one. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. So that is how God described, is described. And here in chapter four, verse eight, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Those are, this is God. Now here is the opponent. And reading these terms now as a contrast ontologically, he was and is not and is to ascend, is about to ascend. So the was and is not and is to about to ascend. You wouldn't be saying that unless you had intended to say something that relates to this term. Either that this is what, how you distinguish between God and the opponent, or how the opponent wanted to be what God is, but isn't. So there is a comparison, a comparative element here. He was and is not, and is about to ascend. It was and is not, and is to come. The beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seventh. So here in the on ontological para parameters, there is a difference between the two, but there is also a comparison. And in this case, also an aspiration on the part of the opponent. That was <clears throat> ontology. Now for the story in time, <clears throat> because you can also lay this out along a timeline. And in, we have four stages here. <clears throat> And these are temporal terms. Stage one, it was. Stage two, it is not. Stage three is about to ascend. And stage four, it goes to destruction. That's in 17 verse 8. And it is repeated almost verbatim in verse 11. Stage one, it was. Stage two, it is not. Stage three, it is an eight. That is an intriguing one. And here, stage four, it goes to destru destruction. So how are we going to, <clears throat> to decipher this? Well, here, the story in time, presence, absence, and presence again. And we are getting, uh, we are putting a Revelation 12 and Revelation 17 together. So here in Revelation 12, the dragon has come to grief in persecuting the woman. But at the end of that scene, the dragon was furious with the woman and went away. He disappeared. He absented himself. Yes, he goes away to make war, but in some ways he vanishes to make war on the rest of her children. That is his, his, uh, his goal. In Revelation 17, we read that it was present and is not present and is to be present again. And I am saying that the 
is not here corresponds to the went away here. That is what we are seeing. There is a story of presence, absence, and presence, and I will lay it out in, <coughs> in more uh, uh, detail. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I have another slide that comes a little after this one. So now we have the story in space. Uh, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And again, we have Dürer's illustration here, and it isn't uh, completely showing where the beast comes from, but the beast comes from the bottomless pit in our text. And here <coughs> we need uh, the, to look back in uh, Revelation to see this term. That is what we wish to understand here, space, the bottomless pit, location. So the fifth angel in the trumpet sequence, he blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. We have an orientation in space. We have an address. We have location. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. So... This is the fallen star who now is in residing in the bottomless pit. And here we have a beast coming up from the bottomless pit in Revelation 17. And <clears throat> I have illustrations for this. This is in the Lyon Apocalypse and the fallen star and the bottomless pit and the key to it and the darkness and the demonic reality here. So the bottomless pit is in some ways the location that epitomizes the story of the fallen star of the of the dragon. And then we read in Revelation 11 about the two witnesses. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. So this must be related to this same reality here. And we have a picture to go uh, with it. This is in the Deuce Apocalypse. And the Deuce Apocalypse very helpfully shows us that it is the beast in the fifth and sixth trumpet that comes up and kills the witnesses here. It is the devil himself. It is Satan, as it were. And then we have <clears throat> one more set of texts here and the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 20, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And here the story again is about the dragon. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the bottomless pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, intriguingly, after that he must be let out for a little while. But so <clears throat> here we have an illustration for that too in the Leon Apocalypse. The Angel coming down with the key and the chain and chaining the dragon and putting him here into the bottomless pit. But the bottomless pit identifies who belongs there, who resides there. That is his domain, as it were, and it is helpful in relation to our text here in Revelation 17. <laughs> and there is one more. We have talked about ontology and time and space and now the course where does this lead it goes to destruction the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction and the beast in verse 11 the beast that was and is not is an eighth but is of the seven and it goes to destruction so <clears throat> what are the 
background texts that are helpful here, well, there is one in Revelation 9 in the fifth trumpet. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, same figure. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, destroyer. And in Greek, he has the name Apollyon, destroyer. So the knowledge here that he goes to destruction and the character of the person who is destroying is in some ways highlighted here. And then there is, <coughs> so let's look at it here. This is the fifth trumpet, smoke coming out from the bottomless pit. And this is the figure named, and his name in English is the destroyer. That is what we are seeing here. And <coughs> then one more text uh, in uh, background text, the story of the fall of the star in Isaiah chapter 14. And the last verse of that poem describing uh, the fallen star, you will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have killed your people. So when Revelation says he goes to destruction, Revelation knows the story. It knows the end game. And it also knows that the one who goes to destruction orchestrates destruction. That is in character with who he is. That's what we are uh, seeing here. And uh, here is a picture of destruction here in the, in the fifth and sixth. Uh, uh, no, this is in the, uh, in the fifth and sixth trumpet, yes. And we see destruction playing out here. <coughs> so <coughs> we read on here. I'm sorry that this is so dense, but this is what John is doing to us. So <coughs> we must not despair. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. All right, this is for intelligent people. <clears throat> this calls for a mind that sees perspectives. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Also, they are seven kings of whom five have fallen. The one is, and the other one has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here is the beast again sitting. On, this is William Blake. There is a woman sitting on the beast. <clears throat> we have not totally uh, concluded on the character of the beast here. Seven heads here. And these heads are seven kings and they are seven mountains <clears throat> also described. So many people who read this, they say seven mountains and they think it must be Rome. Rome has seven mountains. There are seven hills in Rome. They are not exactly mountains. <clears throat> so they are so sure they know that one. And seven kings, it must be some, something related to the Roman Empire. But the word seven is symbolic. The, the number seven is symbolic. It is not the seven hills of Rome. It is the word of complete, the term or the number for completeness of the phenomenon we are describing here. And those who are sure that the seven mountains are easily identified are much less sure about the seven kings <clears throat> because those king lists are just garbled in every way. I have underlined two of the heads here, the one and the other, and I'd like to show how that might, might work. So, <clears throat> Five have fallen. Those are more in a sort of lumping, lumping uh, situation. The one is, who hais is. The other, who allos, has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. So here we can see what to do with this. And here is my, my attempt to illustrate it. This, these are the seven heads of the beast. This is the beast that has the seven heads, the beast that was and is not and is to come. And this is the one, the sixth head. And this is the other, that one is now, this one hasn't yet come. That's what he is giving us. And 
then I will uh, pinpoint what we're talking about here, the one and the other, because of the way Revelation does it. So and the one, that's the sea beast. That's my proposition. And the other is the earth beast. Those are heads related to a beast that isn't the sea beast and isn't the earth beast. Those beasts in Revelation 13 have now been reduced to heads on some bigger creature, some bigger, uh, bigger entity. <clears throat> so I will tell you the mystery, and this is a promise kept. The one, my suggestion, is the beast from the sea. The other is the beast from the earth. And the eighth, <clears throat> which is the eighth, the eighth is the dragon, the Satan himself. So these are <clears throat> uh, uh, laying these things out, and we will return to it in a future presentation to give a little more evidence for this, <clears throat> this understanding. The beast that was and is not is an eighth, but it is of the seven, and it goes to destruction. So we have read that already in verse 8, and here is a scene from the end of Revelation, the New Jerusalem, and the army surrounding the New Jerusalem, and the destruction and self-destruction of the attacking army taking place outside of that city. <clears throat> so looking at this one again, seven heads, the one and the other, and that fits temporally. And here the beast, the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it is of the seven. Those, <clears throat> and, and who is it? It is not any sort of minor, minor actor here. So <clears throat> this scholar, Ernst Lohmeyer, is a German scholar in the middle or early part of the 20th century. He <clears throat> uh, survived the war. He became... He is an outstanding New Testament scholar. He survived the war, and then, lo and behold, he was killed by, uh, in East Germany, by <clears throat> probably orchestrated by the Soviet Union, uh, not long after the war. <clears throat> very, very sad. But I think he captures what is going on here excellently, so I would like to read it. It has not been demonstrated that the beast that was and is not and is to come is historically determined and should be understood in historical sen in a historical sense. It isn't the Roman Empire. It isn't the Emperor Nero. It isn't some other candidate like that. It ascends from the bottomless pit and goes to destruction. These are mythical expressions regarding a God-hating demonic power. And the words... It was and is not and is to come. Read like a demonic mimicking of the divine title who was and is and who is to come. I agree 100% with all of those, uh, uh, those uh, that uh, uh, description. It follows that the surprise of those who are not written in the book of life makes it necessary to conclude in favor of a satanic and not a political power. It's the devil himself. For this reason, it lies close at hand to compass all the visionary sketches within a framework of the demonic myth, cosmic conflict, and explain them on that basis. And this is perfectly stated. All the other candidates are too small. They do not match the sort of reach, the aspiration of the symbols in Revelation. <clears throat> we need to read the re remainder of the chapter and make some conclusions. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. So here is a kind of coming together of powers, a, a kind of unifying <clears throat> moment. These are of one mind and purpose. They agree in giving their power and authority to the beast. And the beast now is a demonic force. It is the real thing. 
they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will win over them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. That's this. So now we are looking at their purpose, the purpose of the bad side, and God's purpose. And here is what uh, we see. Uh, here is my illustration. Uh, plan A, that is Satan's plan. Satan's plan is to disappear and then to reappear. Disappear, disappointing, disappointed, it's kind of retreating, reappearing and now seeming to be successful. That is his plan. God's plan is here. I'm hiding it. I'll show it to you in a moment. <clears throat> And he said, waters as people. And he said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So the prostitute is seated here in a position of ruling and maybe also in a position of popular support that she actually has a following. She has really uh, succeeded in seducing the world, as it were. <clears throat> And we read on, and the ten horns that you saw, those who gave their power to the beast, then, and, the, uh, and the ten horns that you saw in the beast, these will hate the prostitute. Now there is a change of mind. The alliance falls apart. These will hate the prostitute. They will lay her waste and naked, and they will consume her flesh they will burn her up with fire. So something really terrible happens here to the woman after having enjoyed, enjoyed a period of support. And in this illustration of the Deuce Apocalypse, here the woman has been laid waste, as it were. She has been killed and she is being burned with fire in the, in the end of the story. <clears throat> For God has given it into their hearts to carry out God's purpose and bring about one single purpose, to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be brought to completion. Something is coming to completion here. We had their purpose to give their power to the beast and we have God's purpose here, plan A was for the dragon to disappear and to reappear and be successful. That's his plan. Well, what's God's plan? I'm looking at my audience. <laughs> I hope you're there. God's plan is the same. Dragon disappears, dragon reappears. He has some success. This is God's plan. There is one single purpose. And God dares to make his plan identical with the, the side of plan A, Satan's plan, because his strategy is the strategy of revelation. And this plan, ambitious as it was, fails. And God's plan, allowing this plan to play out, succeeds. There is one single purpose. <clears throat> so we are ready to <clears throat> conclude, and I hope that I have shown some things here. We begin here in this image with Albert Dürer in Revelation 12, where there is <clears throat> enmity completely between the woman and the dragon. And we are in Revelation 17, and there is something that has happened in the desert. There is a woman and there is the dragon, the beast, coming up from the bottomless pit. And <clears throat> something has happened in the interim. Let's see what it, what it is. So I am <clears throat> uh, saying now that the dragon here and the beast here are identical. That's what we are saying. <clears throat> and <clears throat> let's add it up now with my image here, the woman sitting on this horrendous beast. On ontology, in ontological terms, the best candidate for the beast that was and is not and is to come is the dragon. There is no other candidate in sight, ontologically speaking. Uh, Time-wise, that this beast was, is not, 
and is to come fits the pattern of presence, absence, and presence. Space, the bottomless pit, is the home base of the fallen star, the home base of the dragon, the home base of Satan. On course, that the fallen star goes to destruction means that means just that he goes to destruction, but it is destruction from within. He is also the one who destroys things. Now here, the woman is destroyed, and later he will also be destroyed, and we will see how that that happens. And thus with the woman, just like he goes to destruction here, and thus with the woman, those who honored her and colluded with her will hate her, lay her waste, consume her flesh, and burn her with fire. They will do it, not God. That's what happens. They will do it, not God. The sentences are all in the active voice, and we know exactly who is doing what. And all of this, strangely, shockingly, and entirely contrary to expectations, accomplishes God's purpose, while the other side carries out its purpose, not knowing that what they were doing was God's purpose as well. <laughs>